well, with that, I'm going to introduce Naveed. Uh, we were chatting earlier. Actually, we've been colleagues for about 20 years or so. Yeah. Um, yeah. On top of all the amazing things that he's done, he's also a USD alum. So, you know, how bad can you be, right? Uh, so that's a good thing, too. Um, so we met about, about 20 or so years ago, actually, on uh, the advisory board. Yeah, I think we were on the right? USD Business School right. Advisory Board. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we met about, yeah, 20 years ago. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Time flies. It really does, so. exactly. It's funny, Sonia is actually down here. She's one of our employees, but she is uh, down from Sacramento and she's with some friends last night okay. and, and met some other friends or friends not expecting. And they were saying, yep, San Diego is a very small community. Everybody knows each other. Everybody's well, well networked. So uh, here we are 20 years later. Exactly. Yeah, so it's great. Um, all right, great. So you do a lot of things. Uh, for those of you that, that haven't looked at Naveed's um, uh, profile on LinkedIn, there's about 17 different titles. I, I literally ran out of room on my paper to include them all. Um, but mainly focusing on analytics ventures, yes. obviously, uh, and sitting on a number of boards right now. Um, so let's start off with, you know, kind of how, how you kind of got to where you are. Right? Let's talk about kind of the, the, the journey. Sure. Know. Yeah. No, I mean, without completely boring the audience. So uh, needless to say, San Diego doesn't have a huge venture capital community uh, compared to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, that said, uh, San Diego is number three in healthcare and biotech and life sciences. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, outside of that, it's uh, it, especially 10 years ago, uh, there was much less. So uh, the long and short of it is I was investing in startups personally and uh, just ended up, frankly, getting addicted and falling in love with working with startups and helping create something out of nothing. And, um, and that's where I wanted to get into venture. Um, I wasn't going to move my family up north. So uh, a, myself and a partner started Analytics Ventures in 2012 to invest in early stage software companies with some monthly recurring revenue mm -hmm. that we thought we could uh, help accelerate. Mm -hmm. um, and in that process, we ended up meeting some scientists out of UCSD, which uh, many of you may or may not know, especially if they're virtual, it's one of the epicenters, one of the birthplaces of artificial intelligence. Right. And so typically when a startup comes to investors, they have a business plan, a business model, you know, a pitch, an investor deck, they had nothing. They come to us and they just say, hey, we're these AI machine learning experts. And this is before it was in the news every day. Um, and they're like, anywhere you could apply to make a prediction, a recommendation, a forecast, or detect anomalies that don't belong, one could increase revenues, decrease costs, bring operational efficiencies. And we said, well, look, we're in San Diego. Healthcare is a competitive advantage. If you want to do a dating app or deliver pizza to you faster app, you know, go to LA or San Francisco. But uh, what can we do in San Diego? We do hard things here is the saying, right? Yeah. And the long and short of it, we said, hey, can you detect breast cancer in a mammogram mm -hmm. better than existing computer-assisted detection technology? Right, sure. And they very confidently said, yeah, we can do that. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up starting the first company under the Venture Studio model called okay. CureMetrics, okay, which is, right, yeah. I'm a founder on the board of it, and I'm, I'm now the CEO of the company. The board asked me to step in in 2019, right before COVID hit. Um, <laughs> so that was interesting. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, and so... Um, Fast forward to present day, that company is recognized as the best AI medical imaging tech in the world in detecting breast cancer and now heart disease right. uh, in the mammogram so the patient gets a two for one. Wow. Um, we ended up starting another company with a lady named Dr. Rizal Kurzrock out of UCSC's Morris Cancer Center. Um, and it was then where we had some early investors say, hey, we love you know, what you guys have done, and but for you, these two companies wouldn't exist. So while we're investors, we're frankly more Proud of saying we're entrepreneurs, yeah, sure. fitting the missing puzzle pieces and helping identify opportunities and, hmm. and uh, building the team. And so that's where we raised our current dedicated fund yeah. um, to do this bigger, better, faster. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm 99% involved on CureMetrics and CureMatch, our healthcare AI companies, right, right. Um, I am on the board of our other uh, analytics the ventures, portfolio yeah. companies. Yeah. Um, so my other partners, of course, yeah. uh, will wear the hat more and more active on others. So that's where as an early stage fund, um, you know, and a lot of VC funds are actually doing this where the, um, the VC will step in operationally or step out. So if any of you know Kim Kamdar locally, she's with Domain Associates, one of the premier uh, medical device uh, focused, traditionally VC funds based here in Boston. And they did the same thing uh, where, you know, she jumped in and helped start a company and then jumped back out. And so more and more, that's actually appreciated in the VC world. When I speak to students at USD or elsewhere, they say, you know, what's the path to get into venture capital? There is no direct path, but increasingly uh, it's valued if they have operational experience, not just 
MBAs from Stanford that are Excel ninjas and right, right. can, you know, but no practical work a spread, yet, but no yeah, practical, yeah. it's not, not hiring people, firing people, right, right. you know, building teams and, yeah, you right. know, and raising capital. It's right. and um, weathering the ups and downs of the economy and uh, ups and downs. And I mean, we've definitely made lemonade out of lemons with COVID right now is, uh, yeah. as you said, said, you've gone virtual, right. we've gone virtual and have now hired people that we've never met right. that right. live in all, you know, all parts of the world or well, country, we have sure. one you could say outside of the U.S., but the fact is, it's like we would have never entertained hiring someone in Oklahoma City or right, right, Dallas sure. before, because we're like, no, we're in San Diego. You need right. to be here. She needs to be here. Yeah. Move here, or you know, but that's part of the offer. And right. and now we we have team members all over the country mm -hmm. that we've hired and um, and fired that we've never met. Sure. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so. Well, I'm curious so, to your point earlier about there there is no direct or uh, formulaic path to becoming a venture capitalist. You were in the financial services industry really early on in your career, right? I so was. How did, how did you make that transition? Yeah, and so I uh, went, uh, traditionally I was UCSD undergrad, uh, went on to USD, did my law and my MBA there. Thought I'd go practice law, but I really just fell in love with the business side and the finance side. So I used to say I didn't go to the dark side of the law. I want <laughs> finance, but then after the 08 crash, I, right. finance was a dark side too. Right. And everything so, was dark side. Everything was dark side, yeah. Right. And so, uh, so yeah, I was at your traditional companies, your Merrill Lynch's of the world, and um, a great experience, wouldn't change it for the world. Um, and uh, met a lot of interesting people. Uh, and, and a lot of them, you know, had made money with selling their own companies mm -hmm. and would ask me to, you know, meet with the CEO of their company to help them with mm -hmm. their pro forma or their business plan or what have you, the marketing. And for whatever reason, they, they asked me and I enjoyed it. And that's where, uh, after about 10 years in the financial services, I decided to to That's jump serious, feet yeah, first yeah. into venture. Because uh, I think in any industry you're in, especially I think from college or grad school, that first decade, mm -hmm. like you have time to figure out if that's not what you want to do right. for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. But the longer you're in it, it becomes harder. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was a transition to say, okay, I'd rather help build portfolios of startups mm -hmm. and help create something out of nothing mm -hmm. than to go help high net worth individuals or pension funds or endowments, right, right. pick the stocks, bonds, mutual funds, hedge funds, VC funds to right, invest. Yeah. And I'd rather help create the next, if we are so fortunate, yeah. Facebook, LinkedIn, right, right. Twitter, et cetera. And of mm -hmm. course on the healthcare side, all the companies that are fighting cancer earlier right, or sure. are recommending the right drugs and so forth. Now, and so, so with not having come up the science side, yep. right? You came up obviously the finance side and with the law degree as yep. well, you've got that, no technical that, background. Yeah, right. So, so how did you, I mean, was it kind of a, a, a chance that you took with your measure to kind of decide, do we, obviously the company believes their technology, right? but how do you as a venture, you know, fund how know for we, sure, is this the right investment to make? So I think, you know, one thing I learned early on in my career and my, uh, my partner, and really he's like an older brother to me, Blaise Barlet, mm -hmm. he's my uh, partner, French gentleman who came here in his early uh, adult life, started one of the early San Diego success stories of the late 90s, a uh, company called Website Story was sure. uh, one of the few internet companies of the era that literally made money from day one, unlike the all the others, the pet.com and beer.com and all the others that like crashed you know, and, crash and burn. And so, uh, so he had a technical background. And so my business and law background complemented his technical mm -hmm. background initially when we started analytics ventures. Uh, and, and so that's where I always say, if you're looking to start a company, if you're looking to partner, do and, and do something with a colleague mm -hmm. or potential colleague, you don't want to be the same. Right. You want to complement each other. Right, exactly. So if he had my background, what's the, you know, like not that it what's couldn't work, but, yeah, sure. but the fact that we were so different allowed us to uh, be more successful. Mm -hmm. And then in meeting, um, you know, the scientists from UCSD, we have just an exceptional team of data scientists that are real machine learning experts, not mm -hmm. just slapping it on their LinkedIn or resumes. Right, right. A lot of people do, and they're really just they're smart people, but they're more statisticians mm -hmm. or mathematicians, right? Sure. And so we, so we, you, you identify those people that are the best at what they do or some of the best. And so I always like to say, I want to be the dumbest guy in the room. And depending on how mad my wife is at me, she'll say it's easy to do. <laughs> but uh, if I say the whole neighborhood. Right, right, right. <laughs> but my whole thing is I want someone that's better at me in sales, better at me in marketing, better at me as a doctor, because I'm not a doctor. Dr. Kersrock, she's amazing. She's one of the top oncologists in the world. 
uh, you know, better me coding or, or anything else that I don't touch. Uh, you know, and, and so that's where if you're building companies or if you're investing in companies, you want to, it, it, it truly is all about the team. I would rather, you know, there's a saying, I don't forget who said it, but you know, Steve Jobs, as amazing as he was, was he was a marketing guy, right? right? And this phone that we all carry around or most of us carry around wasn't necessarily the best technology. A lot of folks would say, you know, oh, there are, you know, Androids that sure, are in right. Google, right? But he marketed like no other, yeah. right? And so it's all about execution and hiring the right team members. Sure. And so uh, that's really what I think has driven our traction and success mm -hmm. is building teams and identifying talent and propelling them. And also, you know, you, you don't bat 100%. So course, yeah. if, if there's situations where someone doesn't work out, you know, the saying hire slow, fire fast, right? Exactly. right? And, and so you got to, I think, do what's best for the business. Yeah. And so how, how has that process changed for you? You talked about hiring one, you know, one person international, other people that are you know, spread out across the country. How yep. has that process of identifying, but also screening people changed for you? And then also onboarding. Once you find that person, right. how do you build that camaraderie and that collaboration when you never see them in person? So that part's more challenging. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let me work that, answer that backwards. So the camaraderie and the culture, there's no substitute to in person here. Body yeah. language is 80% of communication, mm -hmm. right? And so... That, that's harder. That's where, you know, we you know, either ask them to fly in. If they feel comfortable, right, this day and age, you can't ask right, someone right. to come to an in-person meeting or, uh, or companies are doing it. And that mm -hmm. is, you don't want to require uh, it. Though. Right. Okay. And, and so, so that, that part's definitely challenging. We've done, at first I thought it was kind of silly, but we did Zoom happy hours, right? right. right where We've done that too. everyone gets their, you know, favorite beverage or exactly. what have you. And Get or together lunch or whatever. Or lunch or half, yeah. half an hour, just, you know, get on a Zoom with yeah. each other. And, and so we, at the beginning, we did that. We, we're not doing it as much anymore, mm -hmm. um, interesting enough. But so, you know, we, we try to do events like that mm -hmm. uh, initially. Now, uh, you know, for those that are comfortable, of course, and are in San Diego, we can, you know, meet for a lunch or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're still working virtual, but meet, uh, yeah. you know, with those that are comfortable. Sure. Um, but in regards to hiring them and vetting them out, if they're technical, it's actually easier because it, like you see their work product there, yes, right? So our CTO can see who's doing what, who's not, mm -hmm. you know, and it's really like you see the work product. Yeah. Uh, when you There's get- as much gray area. <clears throat> when, you get to, when you get to sales, obviously, uh, you know, a concern from before is, you know, you hire someone, you know, in New York or mm -hmm. Florida or elsewhere and they're in sales, you know, they could be doing, you know, how, how do you know they're putting right, in their sure. best efforts? How do you know they're not, you know, you know, working for you? But there's been articles now, people are doing double jobs, right. right? And so then they do that for six months until you figure out and fire them. And, and so there is always you know, that challenge. All the lost productivity at that point, you got all the lost time. And right. And, and that hasn't happened to us, by the way. The, the, right. the people that we, uh, you know, we, we've let go, uh, uh, it was only been one or two, but mm -hmm. it was interesting enough, not, not anyone in sales. But, um, I think that's where you just have to drive accountability. So right, if our right. chief revenue officer wants to hire someone in Dallas and then in Oklahoma, which we've done mm -hmm. now, um, his success, his success is based on their success. Right, so sure. he's going to be on them if they're inside sales, for example, um, to deliver, right? right or right. we have our, uh, we just hired a director of uh, clinical and regulatory mm -hmm. um, to deal with our FDA clearance mm -hmm, work sure. and all that. Uh, is, is we're growing and need that someone just dedicated 100 percent to that, right. and she's in Toronto, oh, wow. so she has San Diego ties. Um, but uh, but before COVID, moved to Toronto because mm -hmm. of her spouse's job, and um, and so she's going to work yeah, for us sure. remotely. And that's great. At some point, uh, if she wants to be here. She's yeah. welcome, but um, she can do whatever she needs, and we can monitor it because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there, there's no gray area really. Yeah. So. And it's nice, I think, also because it's, as we all have discussed in the past too, it's, it allows you as a hiring manager, as a leader of a company, to now look at talent in places that you probably wouldn't have thought about, you know, pre-COVID. And we're, we're looking to hire another recruiter as well. And I've got my two lead candidates, you know, one is in Denver and one is in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, of all yep. places. I never would have said, hey, I'm going to go find a great recruiter in South Dakota, right? But now, really, there's no barrier. There's no reason Zero. why you can't be there. Zero. And in, in fact, I was on a, a virtual panel 
with the uh, city of San Diego and uh, their EDC is they, of course, their whole premise is to create jobs and retain jobs mm -hmm. in San Diego. Right. But, you know, one thing that came up was, well, we are San Diego companies hiring people right, right. elsewhere. It's you got to kind of change your thinking that's it's, right. that's it's a great point. because these are companies that will be successful in San Diego. Those people, mm -hmm. they might be in Charleston or Atlanta, mm -hmm. right. but, you know, they're going to fly into Lindbergh Field for meetings. They're going to stay at the hotels here. Mm -hmm. Like it's still. So create good some, some revenue for the right city. Yeah. and then on the other side you have people that live in san diego that are working in new york city right. or sf right, right? and right. and so that that's allowing them to stay in san diego instead of having to move to new york so right. they're part of the tax base and mm -hmm. you know spending money here and part of the the right. community here so it's i think it, yeah. it's important to not look at it as a zero-sum game right. of you know right. one person wins one loses right. either you're here or it's a Right. So. I'm curious, as a side note, so there's been so much discussion, and maybe you have read the articles too, a lot of discussion around companies, especially in the Bay Area, or more expensive places, even in Manhattan as well, where if their employees choose to move to a less expensive part of the country, yes. then they're potentially adjusting down their salaries, right? And so, you know, when you're looking at a position, like for, for me, I had, to, I had to put a very broad range in compensation for the job that I'm trying to fill as a recruiter, right. um, because it could be somebody in South Dakota, or it could be somebody in, you know, Manhattan or San Francisco. Um, so how you, have you guys adjusted that in, so, in terms of location? And that reminds me, I think it was Jamie Dimon, the J.P. Morgan CEO, mm -hmm. that said, if you want New York City salaries, you need to live in New York right. City. Like, right. we're not going to pay you the same if you live in Denver. Right. And Which I agree with. Well, I, I, I agree yeah. with 100%. Right. And so what I can tell you is that, you know, we can get people that uh, in San Diego would cost maybe 20, 30% more, right. but now they're, we don't have to. Right. So it's actually sure. worked out for us yeah, because sure, sure. they're still getting at the high end of their range. Mm -hmm. Or where they live. Or where they yeah, live, right. whether it's, you know, Michigan or South mm -hmm. Dakota right. or Oklahoma or Kansas. And so they're, they're loving it. Yeah, sure. In fact, the hire we literally just uh, closed yesterday uh, on, the, on the tech, uh, he was a developer, mm -hmm. um, he lives in the Midwest okay. and his company said, as of October 1st, you have to be back in person. Right. He didn't want to. Yeah. He's an exceptional yeah. uh, developer. And so it worked out for us. It worked out for him. Yeah, sure. He can stay in where he, where he is. And he, he, his, his kids go to school yeah. there. And, and, and so, that's great. so that's where um, I that's, think. That's a nice competitive advantage. It, it is. Yeah. It allows us to compete with this much larger company. Um, and, you know, we have from time to time lost employees to, you know, an Amazon or a Microsoft sure, or, sure. Or, or Nike. Um, and it happens. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we wish people the best of luck. I ever, right. you know, everyone's replaceable from, you know, for me to the, you know, intern. Sure, sure. And so I think that's what's, uh, you know, we have to build redundancies into our business right. that we're not completely reliant mm -hmm. on that one right. individual. To do everything exactly. Right. Elena, we any questions at all, or how are we doing? We good. Any questions here from the peanut gallery? I'm sorry. Can you say it one more time? The well, the current fund is fully allocated. It was a small ten million dollar fund. So when we raised that again, we were not famous guys. We didn't come from private equity or another VC world. We're honestly we're entrepreneurs, and that's what we're most proud of. So that's where when we started Cure Metrics and Cure Match, because initially we were investing our own capital. Um, and Blaze's firepower is a little bit more than mine, having IPO'd a company and sold it for a couple of billion. Um, and so uh, that's where, when we had early investors say, hey, we love these two companies that but for you guys wouldn't exist. How do you, we get in earlier? That's where our attorneys at Cooley said, well, why don't you guys form a dedicated fund? So it's Analytics Ventures Fund One Limited Partners that's going to be on the cap table investing and in, in owning part of these companies from the ground up as opposed to yourselves or your trusts or your LLCs. And, so we said, let's do this first one. Let's do this a little bigger, better, faster. And if we're so fortunate uh, on the right time with the right milestones, we'll you know, do a fun two, three, four, uh, if, if it makes sense. So that's kind of the, how we got from the, there in 2012 to here in 2021. So. It is. No, no, it is. I mean, if, you know, for the next one, uh, you know, whether it's a hundred million or $300 million fund, it's going to be the same amount of work. Right. Cause at the end of the day, and that's where like, I could, I wear the investor hat, I wear the entrepreneur hat. I 
you know, ask for money from investors to raise it for the company. I invested in other, so I, I understand both sides. Um, and it's all about saying, is this the right team? Will they deliver? Or, you know, are, is this the pain point? Is it large enough? Will they, you know, be able to succeed? And it's actually harder to raise a first time fund than to raise money for a startup, because at least for a startup, you say, you know, I'm selling you software for a restaurant or for a dentist practice, or, you know, we're you know going to find the cure to cancer or, or whatever you're going to do, we're going to deliver pizza to you faster. And the investor can, it's going to resonate with them or not. Right. But if you're a first time fund to say, give us your money, trust us that over the next 10 years, because the standard plain vanilla contract language for a fund uh, is, is it's a you know 10 year life. And uh, that's harder, right? Because you're saying, you know, we're going to go invest in software or, or life science or- Especially without track record. Or B2B, yeah, right, before, it's time, a first time yeah. fund. So we, you know, we had a unique angle. We'd already started Care Metrics and Care Match. We had this deep AI bench. In fact, we had firms like Boston Consulting Group, you know, uh, you vet us out and say, you guys have the highest caliber team of AI experts, uh, you know, we found and, you know, they brought us in on, on certain things. Um, but the fact is at the end of the day, if you're an institutional investor at Duke's endowment or Harvard's endowment or the California teacher pension fund or what have you, they're employees at these endowments and they're not going to be a hero. If they invest in a first time fund and it does well, they get a pat on the back, but if it doesn't do well, they get fired. So first time funds, I would always say, unless you got some in or you already started a company and sold it for something, or, you know, you, you, you came from Twitter and you made a bunch of money and, you and your 20 buddies each will put in $5 million, which is a lot of how the funds started in San Francisco is they came from LinkedIn, Twitter, some other company, they're doing angel investing. They're like, Hey, why don't we do a fund? And we're all doing a couple million anyway. And there you got a hundred million dollar fund, right? That's how a lot of them start. Um, and then they get one or two wins and it makes it easy to do fun too. Right? Like the, what's the recent one? Um, uh, like a $400,000 investment became, it went up like a thousand percent. It was in a recent company. Um, and it was off out of, oh, Robinhood. It was a story oh, in wow. Bloomberg where the, the VC fund, it was a first time fund and it was actually a $250,000 check in Robinhood early on. And it, it made their fund, right? So yeah, it's like, exactly. there, there's actually a great movie They're called- live on that for 20 years now. It'll, it's really easy to raise <laughs> a fund right. too, right? Yeah. And so, so that's where it's harder for that first fund. And so I'm not, you know, I would say not call it a waste of time, but it would be a much better use of fund for us to focus on go fund two efforts once we, whether we get an exit or we get a, a meaningful milestone from the current companies to then go and say, you know, we've done these companies over the last four, five, six years. Now we want to you know, go find the next pool. Um, but um, yeah, it makes it easier once if, if you get a Robin Hood and there's a document, nice, yeah. there's a documentary on Amazon called something ventured. Uh, it's over 10 years old now, I think it came out in 2010, but it's still as good as ever. Um, and it's really about how Silicon Valley started in the venture capital industry. I highly recommend it to anyone here or the virtual audience. And um, there was a, like, they literally interviewed the, the folks that started the first firms, Kleiner, Perkins, Sequoia, um, the first ones, right? And uh, there was an uh, older gentleman, um, Arthur uh, Rock, I think was his name. And as they're interviewing him, he says, everyone gets lucky in life. It's just better to get lucky early. Like, <laughs> at some point, everyone, he, his whole thing, right? Great, yeah. And so I think that's that's where, uh, you know, it is, uh, at least on the, the VC world, it's an art, not a science. Mm, sure. And there is absolutely a luck element involved. So if anyone says otherwise, uh, they're, 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 not, they're not, they're not, yeah. they've already been lucky or they're, they're not, right, yeah. or not, or right. they're not being truthful uh, sure, exactly. with, with themselves. Yeah. So, so with all those different things that you just described and your background being in so many different areas too, you talked about, you know, wanting to be, you know, the dumbest person in the room, so to speak, right? right? But how do you, how do you um, identify and then stick with what your strengths are, but also what your passions are? When you're running a fund versus being the CEO versus being on three other, four other boards, right. you're being pulled in a lot of different directions. So how do you stay true to your passion? A hundred percent. So again, 99% of my focus right now is wearing the CEO how to cure metrics okay. and cure match our two AI digital health companies. One detects breast cancer, the other recommends the best combination of drugs. So if a doctor wants to recommend a three drug combo, that's 4.5 million combinations. No human brain can process that. So that's the one we did with Dr. Kurzrock out of the Moore's Cancer Center. And so um, that my passion is, is around that. It's around 
how can AI machine learning impact our lives okay. to live longer, to prolong life, to live higher quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's my focus. And if uh, uh, not, if when we get cure metrics and cure match to a point where I'm no longer needed, mm -hmm. that's what I would look to primarily focus on for a fun two, three or four. Sure, sure. Um, and, and so that's my passion around, you know, how can we detect cancer better? How can we detect heart disease better? How can we uh, make it so that, you know, you know, cancer is not a death sentence, but it's like diabetes or HIV that people can now live with for decades and decades, right. if not get sure. uh, cured from it. And so that's where, you know, healthcare is modern medicine is going to change more in the next 10 years than the last 50. And accessing this information um, is going to be a big part of that because we have more powerful computers. We have more data, whether it's our watches and that are tracking us and our sleeping and our heartbeats. Um, you know, to uh, the, you know, having the cloud so you could process data at less expensive cost, like cure metrics. Not that it couldn't exist without the cloud, but by the fact that we're on AWS, we could process 10 million mammograms tomorrow if we had it, and we pay for that and we're done, right? Hmm. Whereas opposed to the, without the cloud, ago, yeah, you yeah, need sure. to have the hardware, right? Yeah, and, sure. and the capital the resources, even if it's sitting idle for 80% of the time. Right, right. So all these things are leading to why, you know, AI is in the news, deservedly so. Sometimes there is a lot of just vaporware, but it, that's why it's impacting every facet of our life. So my focus is, that's what I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, my partner, Andreas, so I, have a, I have a French partner and a German partner, and I joke that I keep the peace between the French and Germans. <laughs> so, and, and, that's, your, that's your main focus, right? Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a counselor. But um, with our employees too, by the way, a lot of times it's sure. like, you're, you're really, you're, you're almost like a therapist or consultant mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. advice is definitely easier to give than to take. Yes. Uh, so I'm, my, my wife says I'm good, very good at giving advice. I should, <laughs> I should take some every now and then. So. Oh, Lorna. Super, super insightful question. Um, so thank you for asking that. Uh, a couple of things. One, uh, COVID has touched everything, right? So the FDA, 100% focus on COVID for most of last year, right? Um, and now they're, that, that's changing, but that became the number 100% priority. So there's a backlog for other uh, clearances. So that's on the regulatory side. We get it, but it doesn't affect just us. It affects everyone, right? On, in regards to your question as to the academic institutions, what we found is whether you're MD Anderson or Moore's or Memorial Sloan or Johns Hopkins or Mayo, amazing institutions, they do amazing work, but they're their own political beings. And someone that has done work for them on the consulting side had said that, you know, and he, the, this gentleman, uh, I, I won't share his name because he shared this to me in confidence, but he, he said, he goes, I've consulted for Central American governments that are not as bureaucratic as these institutions, right? And, and so uh, the reason I share that is, is you know, you, you get stuck in the mud with a lot of them, and it looks so great to say, you know, MD Anderson or Johns Hopkins, but the fact is they have their own ulterior motives, and they have their own work they want to do, biases. and their own biases, sure. and, and, and doctors are human, and they're incredibly competitive, and they get jealous of other doctors. There's a whole other world that I've that I've seen now that I never would have believed. And I come from a family of all doctors. Like I'm I'm the black sheep that went law and business. My dad, my brothers, everyone's a doctor. Um, and so we actually prefer to focus on the community hospitals, not the academic institutions, because if we can help them take care of their patient better, they don't need to send the patient to Morris or MD Anderson or Johns Hopkins, right? Um, and so on a sales strategy, we found more success. Not that we don't, but we, we have a paper that MD Anderson put out comparing our software for de detecting breast cancer with Hologic, which is the 800 pound gorilla, the biggest company in the yeah. space in the US. Great company, by the way. And we know them and we talk to them. Um, but MD Anderson put a study out, so it's not me drinking our Kool-Aid saying we outperform them, but we knock their socks off, right? Like, and MD Anderson says, Cure Metrics vastly outperformed Hologic software, wow. right? And so 
that helps. Whereas if it's community hospital XYZ that says that, that doesn't resonate as much. So we want to have relationships where we can, but on a sales perspective, I think we're better off, companies are better off focusing on the non-academic organizations. Well, back to knowing your strengths also, and you know where the results come from and kind of where, the, uh, yeah. where you can get the, the not, not quick hits, but more relevant. There's hits. no quick hit in, in healthcare right. at all. Um, and that's a good thing, by the way. Sure. It's like, you're not selling, again, software to deliver pizza or, right. or, or restaurant POS systems. Like right. it's healthcare, it's people's lives. So right. it's a good thing that it takes a little bit more time mm -hmm. um, because uh, it's, it's at some point or another, all of us are going to be needing something. Needing it, yeah, exactly. Um, but, but yeah, we found that for our sales force right now to get our technologies out there, it's it's you're better off not focusing on the the prestigious named necessarily all the time or solely. I think, I think uh, we had actually have a virtual question first. Um, Sorry, I, Amy, one of the questions you. from the chat is: Can you talk more specifically about changes you see happening over the next ten years in healthcare? <laughs> sure. Well, we've got about five hours that's, left. Yeah, sure. So, you want to take your shoes off? And no. Yeah, right, exactly. uh, well, I mean, in, in so many ways, um, you know, our bodies are just software. And so, I mean, I'm dumbing it down because I'm a layperson. So, I need things dumbed down for me by our very sh smart doctors and PhDs and scientists. Uh, our, um, our chief science officer, Dr. Uh, Ali Perlina, she, you know, she's amazing. And and so she'll be able to put things in bullet points that are good for me to be able to communicate with investors and sure. with our uh, shareholders and, 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 and the other people that are not from the field. And so, you know, that's where, you know, whether you're trying to get a drug to market faster or to detect cancer earlier, it's if you're looking to deliver better patient outcomes, it's all about, uh, we say DTM, detect, treat, monitor. And so everyone knows if you detect it earlier, the odds of surviving it or living longer or having a higher quality of life are better. So if you could use AI machine learning applications to detect cancer or calcification in the arteries, that's early onset of heart disease, which is we, we have uh, uh, that, that submitted to the FDA. Um, and the fact is that us men know that heart attacks are a risk. We actually have a much lower pain tolerance than women and we go to the doctor faster. Um, and we, we have symptoms, a lot more. we can play more. <laughs> no, women are, have much higher pain tolerance. Uh, and, and whereas 65% uh, of women that die from heart attacks, uh, they call the silent killer for a reason. Uh, no symptoms, asymptomatic, die on the first heart attack. And so that's where now we can detect the calcification in the arteries from the mammogram. And so up to 10 years earlier, which then you get that patient on statins. You get, you know, if they need a procedure, a stent, unfortunately, at least you get to them instead of having a, an event, right? That could be a, a final event. And, and so that's where it's all detect. And then to treat, well, instead of carpet bombing the body with chemotherapy, now, you know, with precision medicine, you, you can target, right? You could cater for that specific person. If God forbid every single one of us in this room had the same type of cancer, no one of us would have the exact same kind um, because it's, and as Dr. Kurzweil also says, the, there really is no lung or stomach or liver cancer. There's just cancer in the genetic makeup of it. And so that's where you, you have other companies now like Foundation Medicine that Roche bought for a couple billion or Gardent, which is NASDAQ listed and you know, other NGS labs, these next generation sequencing labs that will using an Illumina machine, big local, obviously San Diego success story uh, uh, or Thermo Fisher or uh, you know, others that make the machines, they'll take that cancer biopsy and they'll sequence it and put out a 31 page PDF that says, this is I, I, to the layperson, I say it's a 23 and me of that patient specific cancer where uh, again, now, you know what, okay, what do we do with that? And so that's where we're just software. We don't touch the biopsy. We don't want to, we're not the wet lab. And we can then uh, recommend the best combination of drugs. So the odds of surviving are higher. You can help with clinical trial efficacy. If you recommend the right number of patients for, or the patients that are going to respond better to a clinical trial, and you could shave a hundred million dollars in one year off that time to get the drug to market, you just, you're going to save lives, right? Because it takes 10 years, typically in a billion dollars to get a drug to market. So, you know, 10% one year, that's, that's, that's a big thing. With regards to leadership. 
Well, that's kind of a broad question. Uh, I mean, well, I was, I'm going to use that in combination to my question also. Mine, mine was going to be about collaboration. Okay. So maybe leadership could be an offshoot to that. But my thought was that with, with COVID and all the amazing press and write ups about how you know, these you know, siloed huge pharma companies actually got together and worked together to find this vaccine or multiple right, vaccines, right. has that changed the way medicine is, is approached? And maybe leadership now to okay. that question is maybe different. No, no, okay. So I, I appreciate that yeah. kind of twist on it. So uh, I think we've all seen that you know, with collaboration, with not being in silos, there, you know, we all benefit, right? And so there, I think uh, all leaders are looking at that, whether they're the CEO of public pharma companies, to hospital organizations, to startups in the healthcare space. Um, so it's, you know, if, if, if you can lock arms and do something faster, there is a very collaborative environment still in healthcare. Uh, there's always those that want to do things right. themselves. Um, but I do think that um, leaders, especially the bigger companies, they, need to look at innovation happening at the ground floor at startups and also at these institutions. Uh, there was a nonprofit, I'll, I won't mention the nonprofit, but it's a very well-known one. And they spend tens of millions a year on research, research around cancer. Yeah, sure. And their main complaint is they spend all this money on this amazing research, these amazing PhDs and doctors and MDs, and it doesn't get the market. Right, it sticks in research and it dies in research at, at the institutions. And, and, and there's no resources. There's a treasure trove dedicated of, to it because there's no money in it. It's not, not the, well. So there's not. there's money in it, but there's actually the human psychological element too. That a lot of these researchers and doctors, it's their baby, and they they have to be the one that gets it to market. And they're completely one hundred percent the wrong CEO, right? And they're the wrong person in that regard. And and I always say, like, if, if, if you have a doctor, like, if they don't want to practice medicine and see patients, like, I don't know if I want to go see them, right? right. So, if anything... It's like a teacher that hates kids. Right. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, so that's where I, I think in, in, there's no perfect solution to it. But if universities and these institutions could, from whether it's their tech transfer offices, and UCSC is actually doing a great job. Uh, they've come leaps and bounds in just the 10 years I've... Uh, I've worked with them and um, Paul Roden, the gentleman there, Irish gentleman, fantastic. Um, but I think have a meaningful value for the technology developed for the scientists and the academics and the PhDs. And so, the, and then try to pair them and match them with the investors that that'll resonate. So, you know, you, you don't need to waste time with a VC or an investor that is in B2B enterprise sales if it's a life science drug, right? It's like, you also got to match the right people. And I, I think that's also another thing where sometimes, you know, scientists or founders or anyone, even if they're not technical from, you know, any background, mm -hmm. um, you know, building a, a, a software for real estate companies, mm -hmm. whatever it is, like the, the, here, the, the second they hear someone is an investor, whether an individual or a, a fund, they, you know, the thought is, oh, well, I have a company, I'm raising money, but yeah. That doesn't make sense. Like, if you have a software for dentists, go talk to dentists, right. right? Don't go to the guy that is, you know, your neighbor and is in commercial real estate. It's not that he might not invest or she might not invest, but it's going to resonate better with folks that get it. Yeah, exactly. So, anyway. Amy, you had a question before? Did we already answer it? Uh, yes, we do. We do, and we've definitely been uh, aggressively growing it. And do they come from a background where they're they're accustomed to selling to hospitals? Directly? They have to be. Okay, yeah, they have to be. So everyone we've hired from, like I said, the that's now in Atlanta and Dallas, in Michigan, Oklahoma, Oregon, they've all it's one point or another. They sold for GE. They sold for Siemens. They came from the industry. And something interesting, actually, that Ken, you and I talked about mm -hmm. before this meeting, um, it's all about getting the right people at a company at the right time. So mm -hmm. if, you know, Tracy, who he's our chief revenue officer at Curemetrics, he's in Atlanta, Georgia, like, the guy's been in the industry for decades, like, people's heads turned that we were able to hire him, mm -hmm. but he would be completely useless at the company even three years ago, because it would be too early on. Mm -hmm. and. Sure. You know, like we, we, whether we didn't have a clearance or a product ready, like you don't need someone of that caliber early on, right? Yeah. 
or it's like if you get this, you know, former CEO of Sharp Hospital who's retired, you know, uh, great guy Mike Murphy, like he ran Sharp Hospital, right? So if you get Mike on a board, that's amazing. If you get Mike, assuming he wants to be operational at a company that's later stage, that's great. But from a startup, yeah, right. So it's all about finding the right people at the right time. You just described my entire industry. <laughs> that's what it's all about. Same kind of thing. Well, and, it, and, and the board needs to be the board and the investors and anybody else that's involved needs to understand that. Right? Yeah. You don't you don't bring in a startup CEO to turn a company around. No. And vice versa. It's got to be the right you know, combination of skill sets. Too. Absolutely. No, I know. And and that's where uh, you know I tell everyone that you know everyone's replaceable and some people can grow with a company. So. But then you have those people that, uh, you know, they like that startup environment. They're like, oh, remember when we used to have champagne lunch or, you know, Fridays, champagne Fridays, I think what they called it. Right. Like, oh, the culture is just not the same anymore. Oh, look at all these new people coming in that, you know, were GE or Qualcomm or elsewhere. And, right. and, and so, but some people can adapt and mm -hmm. grow. Sure. And then otherwise, is people that are used to the more traditional nine to five, big mm -hmm. company jobs, the security that comes with that would never take the risk at um, a startup, right. because- And that's okay. That's, that's okay. Change it There's exactly. absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's okay. nothing wrong with it. it just, it's, you have to know yourself, I think. Right, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. No, that's a great question. And I, I, th I think that whole aspect of, there's, they call it a DPC, direct primary care, or these subscription models. You can walk across the street to UTC mall. There was, uh, it's called Forward Health where any one of us could pay $149 out of pocket or our employers can choose to cover that. And we have an app. We can walk into the facility that, you know, it looks like an Apple store. It's in high-end malls. It's, you know, there's people that increasingly, they want to pay to have to be proactive about their healthcare and they don't care about paying out of pocket. So I, th I think the, the consumer, all of us are going to drive that change. And absolutely, like, like get to the cause, detect heart disease earlier and get on statins you know, you know, before you're having shortness of breath and, you know, in the ER. And, and so, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, um, you know, we're seeing more of that. And without example specifically, I know someone that because of the eye watch, they were getting high resting heartbeat. And they're like, huh, that's weird. Huh. Goes to the primary care doctor. Doctor said, okay, well, your cholesterol is a little high. Everything else seems fine. You know, why don't you go see your cardiologist? EKG was fine stress test was fine. And they ended up doing a calc score, which is out of pocket, but the person wanted to pay for it. And it came back and it shocked everyone. And so now this person is on statins. They know they need to be worried. They have, they had heart disease in the family, but if, if, if that person had not detected it off this piece of technology in three, four years, by the time they've detected, felt something, uh, you know, they might've had to have a stent if God forbid something worse hadn't happened to, for them. So yes, to your, that's being long winded, but it's a great question is that it's all about right now being proactive, not reactive. To that, to that point, I'm curious. So um, I, I'll use analogy of, of cars as well. Things, you know, safety features on cars that were only high end luxury cars 10 years ago are now standard. Right. Right. So to your point, you said that the only reason that that person that you're talking about found that extra thing uh, was because of the extra, you know, out of pocket expense for that additional, you know, test. Right. Are those kinds of things going to become more the norm where it's everybody has access to it? I, I th yes. And I think or, it's, do you, do you see that, that no, kind of trend? it's, it's yeah. going to happen. And I think the, there's the two deepest pockets in healthcare, are the pharma companies and the payers, the insurance companies. And I think it's only a matter of time, not if, but when uh, the insurance companies demand it and say, we're not going to pay for these drugs for this patient. Because how do you know it's the right combination mm -hmm. or, you know, no more kind of one size fits all kind of thing for a given right. ailment. Right, and know? so the, the genomics and the testing to to say this is catered for this specific person, right. and insurance companies won't pay for it otherwise. Um, and also, um, in regards to uh, you know, with with the fact with um, doctors and malpractice and all this stuff, I think that's going to be factored in soon, sure. where it'll frankly yeah. be verging on a malpractice, if not legally, in regards to the laws being changed to not do some of these procedures, let's say calc score, mm -hmm. you know, once a year or twice a year, or, or just like it's, you know, you know, now beaten into our heads for decades, like, you know, get a mammogram every year after a certain age or right. get your prostate checked. Right? right. And so I think that education is going to happen. Uh, but also uh, 
again, the law is always behind technology, but the law will catch up and the law in regards to malpractice. Yeah, sure. in, 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 and so I'm, I think- I'm, I mean, making everything more personalized just makes logical sense. And again, as opposed to, like you said, you know, bombarding the body with the same chemotherapy for everybody for right. given cancer, let's focus on the particular area. Yeah, makes sense. 100%. Yeah. Wow. I know we're just about out of time. You, but like, us. <laughs> don't be so arrogant. <laughs> I, I don't know. Wow. How, how, that's, by the way, one of the <laughs> best books I've ever read, Bad Blood, if you haven't read it. And I know there's a couple of documentaries out. Um, and uh, I think the lesson there, especially in healthcare, is that it's very different because people's lives are on the line. So if, it, it's very normal if you're, again, in your traditional software as a service, you know, enterprise, you're building, hey, we're going to build this and it's going to help the restaurant sell X percent more beer or food, or, or we're going to build this and this is what it's going to be able to do to help Irvine Company, you know, fill its buildings and get higher rent. Right. It's very different when you're talking about healthcare. And people's lives. And that was like, and again, not to ruin the book or the story for those that haven't read it, but like they faked tests that, you know, if, like that kills people. Right. right. And, and so I think uh, in healthcare, there is no gray area for, uh, for that. And yeah, fake it till you make it is not okay in healthcare. Fake, yeah. You know, fake it till you make it is, is a saying in your traditional, again, your software, enterprise, B2B, B2, sure. like that type of stuff, the dating app, the deliver food to you app, but not in healthcare. Yeah. So, okay. great question. Yeah, I guess. How are we on time, Elaine? Are we um, 50? Oh, the last up. All right, so so um, any last questions here from folks that are here? All right, so to kind of, kind of wrap up then, what would you say, uh, and, and as, as an aside, if you haven't, if you heard the um, podcast Business Wars, if you heard or not, but it's always, it's, a, it's an amazing podcast. It's, you know, Netflix versus, um, uh, blockbuster, why they fail, HBO versus mm. Disney streaming, whatever it is. But there's a fantastic one that I listened to recently about COVID and the development of the vaccines. And to your points earlier on, you know, Oxford University, were actually, they found the vaccine first, but because of the arrogance, whatever you want to call it, of the professors there and the scientists, you know, they didn't let it out to the public. And you can listen to exactly why. Um, and the science, your other, your other point, the scientists that actually found the benefits of MR, mRNA Right. She took it upon herself for over 20 years to stick with it and not give it up, even though nobody would support her, her, her research. Um, so those are the kind of people that are amazing that yeah. have gotten to us, gotten us to where we are today with COVID. So listen to that if you have a chance. So with that as a backdrop, any what, what, what's kind of your your um, recommended takeaway for us this, this morning? What should we be doing as the as on the patient side, if you will, to take better care of ourselves, to ask our doctors more questions, whatever it might be? that we can do yeah. that will just help with our own personal health? I think that's a fantastic question. And just remember that doctors are people. Right, yeah. There's good people and bad people. Sure. And don't just blindly take what they say for face value. Okay. Ask questions. And yeah, everyone is an internet doctor and will go Google things, which is scary, right? You, there's so many bad things when you, you know, Google whatever yeah. symptom. Uh, so yeah. uh, I, I would say always get a second opinion if it's something serious. Okay. So I know someone that had a cancer that was terminal and the, they were referred to the oncologist. The oncologist said, well, you know, come back next week. We're going to start doing this regimen of chemo because it's a standard of care. Okay. Uh, but as a terminal cancer, they said you had four or five years to live at best. This person did their homework and they ended up finding clinical trial. And because of precision medicine, they are now cancer free. Wow. If they did not do that themselves, they would very likely not be with us right yeah, now. Yeah, sure. So Which don't, is kind of counterintuitive because you think, well, I trust the expert, go with the expert, but not every expert is is the most expert in your situation. And I mean, there's horrible, there's there's, there's always there's always bad apples everywhere. There's a few years ago, the 60 minute piece where there's a doctor in Michigan that was telling people they had cancer that they didn't because he was selling the chemo drugs. Because in the U.S. and in, in, in you know, don't ask me why or how, but there are some instances where the doctors benefit from selling the drugs, and so whether they get it wholesale or how they do it, but um, Anyway, so I'd say I have the utmost respect for doctors. Again, like so many people in my family, my wife's family, um, uh, but we're all it's okay human. To question it. It's yeah. okay yeah. to question it. And, um, you know, whether it's uh, a cancer or heart or anything else, just 
question it and also be proactive. And I think people are willing to pay increasingly out of pocket. If, you know, if, if, if you are paying every year you renew your health and is the HMO or PPO and you want to pay this for dental or vision, if, you know, someone said, okay, for two bucks or three bucks or five bucks, you get, you know, access to some digital health sure, yeah. apps that do different things. I think people are more and more willing to pay it. Yeah. So. Hey, right, last questions. Are we good? All right. Well, thank you very much. Please thank join you, me Ken. in thanking Navid for all those great insights and advice and for being here in person also. My pleasure. I need to take off for your next meeting too, but so, I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll let you know what's going to happen as far as next month goes, either in person or virtual. For those that are virtual, thank you all for joining us as well. It's great to have you here. Uh, yeah, we all, we're all waving <laughs> virtual hugs. Um, and then we'll let you know what's going to happen for next month as well. But feel free to follow up with any questions. I know Navid is very active on LinkedIn as well. So uh, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you all. Have a great week. Thanks. Thanks.